Welcome to Founder Stories. I'm Mike Abbott. With me today, we have Carl Jacobs from Hangtime. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, before we begin, maybe you can tell us a little bit about Hangtime. You bet. So if you think back about five years ago, everybody went to a different website to get airline tickets. We'd go to American Airlines or U.S. Airways or whatever it might be until a site called Kayak came along and aggregated all that data together in one place so consumers could discover the best route and the best price. And you saw the same thing happen in music in Pandora and Spotify who aggregate all these music uh, pieces into one place so users can have a better discovery experience. And they, of course, insert themselves in front of that, that behavior. So we're doing the same thing in the event space. We're aggregating all of your Facebook events, what your friends are doing, what they might be doing, uh, Ticketmaster events, StubHub events, Ticketfly, you name it, putting them in one application in one database, and then consumers are able to see what's going on around them amongst their friend group, and then also what's going on around them in their interests uh, that their friends may not know about yet. Hmm. This sounds really like an interesting product. Thank you. Well, we're pretty excited about yeah. it, and consumers love it, so that's a good, good, that, good that, place to be. That's the most important thing. So yeah. kind of backing up, this is your sixth Sixth, yeah. Company. Sixth or seventh, depending on how you how, calculate. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you've obviously been a serial entrepreneur by definition <laughs> right. doing that. Exactly. And you've raised well north of $200 million that's, across yeah, those. that's correct. So I'd uh, love to hear about... Um, you know, we'll start with product because I mean that's the most right. important thing. And, and through the, the evolution of those six different companies, right. like how does product now get built at hang time versus that first company you started, you know, X years ago? It's radically different, and I think in many ways you have to unlearn everything you mm -hmm. learned building product back then. Uh, you know, in the early days, you had a PRD and a spec, and you had technical specs, um, and you did all that work. Then you built the product, right? And then a year into it, you maybe released it to a small beta audience to see what they thought. Uh, now it's completely different. In fact, when we started Hangtime, we decided to follow in the footsteps of companies like Facebook and Zynga and others, where we actually A-B tested just the concept to see if consumers found it compelling enough uh, to click a button or you know go into the site. Um, and I think in many ways that's the way of the future because you can learn a lot very, very quickly for not very much money. And you don't end up putting a concept out there that you know won't resonate with customers. Interesting. And now, uh, one thing that comes to mind as I'm listening to you is you, you have this kind of new model, quick iteration of product. Um, has that same evolution also occurred for you as the CEO? I mean, like you probably had a certain way of how you were a CEO, right. the first company. Right, right. You've kind of changed. Do you, do you do A-B testing as the CEO? or That's interesting. Um, you know, I, I think you actually do. I mean, in many ways, if you're building a product, I think the way the company runs is a reflection in many ways of the mm -hmm. product. And so what I found myself doing, in fact, was not getting too attached to ideas. Um, I, you know, as, as an older CEO in the past, you know, you'd have a very pa a passion for an idea and you'd carry that passion on. What I do now is I, I try to have a kind of healthy dose of skepticism uh, until I actually see it uh, tested by consumers and it comes back. Um, as far as running the company, I think you uh, a actually have to you know, lead in the way you expect other people to, to act. And so you know, if you come into the room and you say, well, I really think we should do it this way, uh, and somebody says, well, no, I think we should A-B test it, and you say, no, 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 I'm, I'm positive about this, that's not exactly demonstrating you know, the way that you'd like them to operate. You know, one, one of the questions that's merged a lot in different companies is how you use that data from users to influence your product or not. Right, right. Uh, and, and kind of how, where have you kind of landed on that with your, I mean, the set of experiences now at a time? Yeah, I, I, I think, um you know, a friend of mine said way back when, when I started my, uh, my career, that consumers lie. Uh, and what he was referring to was this idea that you could go into a room and interview a bunch of people and they would tell you what kind of product uh, to build. And what happens nine times out of ten when products are built that way is that when you take it out and test it, consumers don't even want the product that was resulting. So I, I think there's this process now that, that people are, are starting to go through where it's evaluating the feedback in the context in which it was given. 
And so if a consumer uh, is being watched or know they're being watched, they tend to behave in one way. They want to feel like they're smart and they want to um, solve the problem. Whereas if it's a usability test where you're behind a screen and you're filming them or you're watching click streams or tap streams on a, on a mobile application, there's nobody there to prod them or, or no kind of burden on top of them to make them kind of do one thing versus another thing. So they act normally. So I think it's a healthy dose of kind of A-B testing the concept and then we're actually looking at the data, trying to understand what the user's trying to accomplish and what they're trying to do uh, versus asking them, hey, would you like the button here or would you like the button mm -hmm. here? I'm going to switch topics kind of sure. dramatically. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that we were talking about before right. we started was how you've negotiated 22 term sheets. I think that's about right. And uh, yeah. I was checking, like, I don't necessarily know even as, as a VC now, I'm going to create 2022, <laughs> but regardless, um, Share with you know the audience like what are the what are some of the, the key top two three things you've learned? I mean that's just a remarkable set of things. I'm sure you've seen good, bad, ugly. Right, uh, right. Um, well, I, I guess my favorite is if if uh, the person you're negotiating with says these are our standard terms, <laughs> don't don't believe that. standards very relative. Right, my standard is different than that, your standard. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, I think the other is that it truly is a marketplace. Um, you know, when you were, we were raising money for CloudMark back in in the day, you know, right after the dot com implosion and everything like that. Um, you know, the terms were just three times liquidation preferences, half of the company. Um, so market timing is actually pretty important to the way you negotiate a term sheet, uh, which is one of the reasons you want to raise money and have it last a long time so that you can kind of push through those time periods and not have to negotiate at a time when it just it's the market and the mm -hmm. market will command that. Um, the other is, and, and this is I do often with a lot of the entrepreneurs that I mentor, is read the term sheet and really understand the terms. I'd say 90% of the terms in a term sheet, most entrepreneurs don't understand. Um, and they often don't understand, even if they do understand them, they don't understand the true implications. Uh, and that's everything from board structure to you know, the, the classic option pool before the, you know, the, the terms or before the round or after the round. These things, they're very complicated. They have really big impacts on how the company uh, is able to operate down the road. And you know, having done lots of term sheets, of course, I've seen things go wrong. And so I encourage entrepreneurs to think about, well, what, what if this goes wrong? You like you know, the, the company, you like the team, you like the board of directors, you like the investor, but sometimes things don't work out. And so look at it, that lens as well, the, the negative, like what if we do have to break up or what if they don't think I'm the right person uh, to, to do the job? Is there a vehicle in, in the term sheet or ultimately the, the documents that allows that to be resolved amicably or is it just uh, you know the, the investor makes the decision and it's done? Mm -hmm. What is your view on, I mean, Angelus has done some interesting things around making a tip that's standardizing term yes. fees. Do you think that's the case, or is it always going to be these idiosyncrasies based on the market timing, which I think is an interesting point? Well, I, th I think it helps a lot because a lot of the terms that uh, lawyers tend to throw in get, get taken out because both parties are like, well, is it really worth it to slow the negotiation down or, or in fact, to create a standard term sheet if we have to pile in all these things that are... Uh, in conflict, right? So um, it, the good news with a lot of that stuff is that you reduce it down to the bare essence. Um, and you're not in a situation where you know somebody goes, oh, I just heard this guy the other day did this term sheet this way, so I'm not going to try to throw that in. And we've seen that in the evolution of the convertible note. Right, convertible notes used to be these nice, clean, easy vehicles, uh, and now, as, as you know, some of them are very complicated and look a lot more like you know a, a real Series C or a Series Series A. So, if we had to just kind of distill this down to maybe a, a couple areas, though, that, that we can give our audience some guidance. And one is, you said board structure. Yeah. Uh, maybe timing yep. of the option pool. Is right. it before or right. after? Right. Right. And what right. would be another one or two? Uh, I think one of the, the, the bigger ones for, for entrepreneurs, particularly when there's lots of liquidity options before the company you know, goes public or sells, is to think about how hard it is for you to sell your shares. And you know, back in the day, it yeah, used, it used it. to be. Remember, there, you well, you can sell your shares, but then the company has a right of first refusal, and then if the company doesn't take it, then every single investor takes it. And so I've actually been in situations back in '99, 2000, 2001, where it would take somebody in the company a year just to get to the point where they could sell their shares. Of course, by then the buyer is gone. Um, 
And so I think thinking about that now, um, you know, is, is important because, you know, founders are getting liquidity earlier on and you want it to be kind of a clean and easy discussion, um, which, which often these days is, is okay. But, you know, I've, I've seen founders be very upset, you know, in particular if the company doesn't do as well that they had an opportunity to take some money off the table and weren't able to. I think it's a great point. I mean, uh, and there's also implications for what you're describing for the employees. Right. Um, right. Obviously, exactly. just in the secondary yeah. market uh, yeah. as well. Yeah, I think maybe one even bigger than that is um, what what control really means in these companies. I have mm-hmm. a recent experience about three months ago, uh, where we were offered a great term sheet at one of the companies I was working with, and great round, great valuation, and everything like that. Um, but the entrepreneur hadn't thought through the board structures we talked about earlier, and effectively, he was giving up control of the company, and he didn't realize it. Uh, so it's one thing to give it up when you know you're giving up. Mm. He had no idea, and so we kind of walked through blocking rights and how you know, if you have a blocking right for acquisition, a blocking right for taking more money as an investor, you effectively control 90% of, of the outcomes that, that are probably going to happen. I think oftentimes uh, entrepreneurs, especially uh, technical ones, you know, they hire an attorney and they kind of trust that he or she yeah. is going <laughs> to give them this data, right? Right, right. Um, sounds like what you're suggesting is that that's not always the case and it's really important yeah. to kind of walk through that. Yeah, and I, I think the lawyer's job isn't just to say it's okay, it's standard. In fact, uh, in a situation I was in recently, um, the lawyer said these are standard and, and I said, well, go find another term sheet that is recent that has these in it and he was unable to do that. Um, Interesting. So I think the lawyer's job is one, to provide guidance, but two, as a younger entrepreneur, I think the lawyer should help educate you. And you know, I've worked with some great lawyers in the past, Anthony McCusker, for instance, who he will lit- he literally sat me down and walked through every single term early on so I understood not only you know the reason for the term, but also the negative outcomes that could come from that. I really like your point. I mean, I think it's something oftentimes, and just from my own experience, it was like, hey, who's a good attorney? And right. someone refers you, and you're like, right. okay, awesome. Like, right. the person's going to help me close my round of finance. Right, exactly. And you just want to go back to building the product. Because right. like, yep. it's yep. kind of your bias, right? right. You're biased right. to what you like to do and what right. you know. But there are these long term implications that, like, many of us have seen that, you know, it tend to come up when the situation is not as pretty as others. Right, right. Um, and, and but you have to consider right, those. Right, exactly. And, and it's funny, I, I think one of the things I've learned over all these term sheets is that, you know, a lot of things you argue about, you shouldn't argue about. The company's either going to be huge or it's going to go to zero, right? The in-between, it's interesting, but nobody's going to make a whole lot of money and um, nobody's going to be happy in, in those areas. And so, Think about the edge cases, right? Um, where, the, well, seemingly edge cases, but 90% of companies do one of two things: they either go to zero, or you know, they they, they blow up. Mm-hmm. Um, and making sure that you're thinking about those is really important. That's really good. Now, um, in those six companies you've been involved with, they've kind of went to different stages right. and you built boards, right. kind of in different ways. When you look at your board at hang time or how you plan on building out right. that board, what right. what are kind of the lessons that you've learned? I think the number one mistake I've made as an entrepreneur is not having an outside board member, um, or more specifically, a truly independent outside board member. Um, That is a balance inside of a company that I think that's really critical, particularly when things don't go well. Um, It's just very hard, particularly when your board is composed of just investors and the CEO, um, when things are going bad for for investors to kind of take themselves out of wearing the hat for their fund um, Mm -hmm. and and instead wear their hat for the company as as well. Um, And having kind of a third party to bounce things off of and communicate with, I think, can be helpful. A lot of VCs can. I mean, the the great ones, I I think, can can do that. Um, But it's, it's pretty hard when you have... $20, $30, $40 20 30 40 million dollars into a company to take that investor hat yeah. off and I, try to think about you know. I think you're right. I mean I think that's a really important. I know um, with composite software I left that seat unopened and I regret yeah. not filling that in. Right. Because I think there's a good kind of mediation that, that he or she brings right. and I know right. we certainly tried to bring that in. But Carl, thank you so much for coming on Founder Stories today. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.